Hey, it's Brian, back with another Burr Month's bonus episode for those of us getting an early start on the Christmas season. It's almost the end of October and the countdown to Christmas is in full swing, and I'll bet that you're looking for some new Christmas podcasts to liven up your playlist. Well, I created the definitive directory of Christmas podcasts to help you along your way. It's a list of over 160 Christmas podcasts grouped into 12 different categories, and you can find it over at christmaspast.media or check the show notes to this episode for a link. It is the most complete and best organized list of Christmas podcasts you will find anywhere else. I guarantee you that. There's something for everyone, and almost certainly you will discover some new podcasts that you wouldn't have found otherwise. So again, check out the definitive directory of Christmas podcasts at christmaspast.media. Also, let me very strongly encourage you to share a Christmas memory on the show this season. Don't be shy. Just record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. You can talk about what Christmas was like when you were growing up, you can talk about a favorite Christmas memory, or just the things you happen to love about the season. The point is simply to share your Christmas spirit with the rest of the Christmas Past family. Just keep it reasonably short, clean and family friendly, and be sure to say your name and where you're from. Now today I have another classic piece of Christmas fiction for you. This one's from 1917 by Cyrus Townsend Brady. It's the story of two girls celebrating the same Christmas morning, although not quite. I'll come back at the end to wrap up and say goodbye, but for now please enjoy the 1917 short story, It Was the Same Christmas Morning, by Cyrus Townsend Brady. In Philadelphia, the rich and poor live cheek by jowl, or rather, back to back. Between the streets of the rich and parallel to them run the alleys of the poor. The rich man's garage jostles elbows with the poor man's dwelling. In a big house fronting on one of the most fashionable streets lived a little girl named Ethel. Other people lived in the big house also, a father, a mother, a butler, a French maid, and a host of other servants. Back of the big house was the garage. Facing the garage on the other side of the alley was a little, old, one-story-and-a-half brick house. In this house dwelt a little girl named Maggie. With her lived her father, who was a laborer, her mother, who took in washing, and a half-dozen brothers, four of whom worked at something or other, while the two littlest went to school. Ethel and Maggie never played together. Their acquaintance was simply a bowing one, better perhaps a smiling one. From one window in the big playroom, which was so far to one side of the house that Ethel could see past the garage and get a glimpse of the window of the living room in Maggie's house, the two little girls at first stared at each other. One day, Maggie nodded and smiled, and then Ethel, feeling very much frightened for she had been cautioned against playing with or noticing the children in the alley, nodded and smiled back. Now neither of the children felt happy unless they had held a pantomimic conversation from window to window at some time during the day. It was Christmas morning. Ethel awoke very early, as all properly organized children do on that day at least. She had a beautiful room in which she slept alone. Adjacent to it, in another room, almost as beautiful, slept Celeste, her mama's French maid. Ethel had been exquisitely trained. She lay awake a long time before making a sound or movement, wishing it were time to arise. But Christmas was strong upon her, the infection of the season was in her blood. Presently she slipped softly out of bed, pattered across the room, paused at the door which gave entrance to the hall which led to her mother's apartments, then turned and plumped down upon Celeste. "'Merry Christmas!' she cried, shaking the maid. To awaken Celeste was a task of some difficulty. Ordinarily, the French woman would have been indignant at being thus summarily routed out before the appointed hour, but something of the spirit of Christmas had touched her as well. She answered the salutation of the little girl kindly enough, but as she sat up in bed, she lifted a reproving finger. But, she said, you must keep the silence, Mademoiselle Ethel. Madame, votre madame, she must not be disturbed in the morning. She have been out very late in the night, and she have to go to the bed very early. She say you must be very quiet on the matin de Noël. I will be quiet, Celeste, answered the little girl, her lip quivering at the injunction. It was so hard to be repressed all the time, but especially on Christmas Day of all others. Then I will help you dress immediately, and then William, he will call us to see the tree. 
Never had the captious little girl been more docile, more obedient. Dressing Ethel that morning was a pleasure to Celeste. Scarcely had she completed the task and put on her own clothing when there was a tap on the door. What is it? Morning, Miss Celeste, spoke a heavy voice outside, a voice subdued to a decorous softness of tone. If you and Miss Ethel are ready, the tree is lit and... We are ready, Monsieur William, answered Celeste, throwing open the door dramatically. Ethel opened her mouth to welcome the butler, for if that solemn and portentous individual ever unbent, it was to Miss Ethel, whom in his heart of hearts he adored. But he placed a warning finger to his lips and whispered in an awestruck voice, The master, your father, came in late last night, miss, and he said that there must be no noise or racket this morning. Ethel nodded sadly, her eyes filling at her disappointment. William then marched down the hall with a stately magnificence peculiar to butlers and opened the door into the playroom. He flung it wide and stood to one side like a grandier as Celeste and Ethel entered. There was a gorgeous tree, beautifully trimmed. William had bought the tree and Celeste's French taste had adorned it. It was a sight to delight any child's eyes, and the things strewn around it on the floor were even more attractive. Everything that money could buy that Celeste and William could think of was there. Ethel's mother had given her maid carte blanche to buy the child whatever she liked, and Ethel's father had done the same with William. The two had pooled their issue, and the result was a toy shop dream. Ethel looked at the things in silence. How do you like it, miss? asked William at last, rather anxiously. Mademoiselle is not pleased? questioned the Frenchwoman. It, it is lovely, faltered the little girl. We have selected them ourselves. Yes, miss. Didn't Mama buy anything, or Papa, or Santa? They tell us to get whatever you would like and never mind the money. It was so good of you, I'm sure, said Ethel, struggling valiantly against disappointment almost too great to bear. Everything is beautiful, but I... I wish Mama and Papa had... I wish they were here. I'd like them to wish me a Merry Christmas. The little lip trembled, but the upper teeth came down on it firmly. The child had courage. William looked at Celeste, and Celeste shrugged her shoulders, both knowing what was lacking. I'm sure, miss, that they do wish you a Merry Christmas and... The butler began bravely, but the situation was too much for him. There goes the master's bell, he said quickly, and turned and stalked out of the room gravely, although no bell had summoned him. You may go, Celeste, said Ethel, with a dignity not unlike her mother's manner. The maid shrugged her shoulders again, left the room, and closed the door. Everything was lovely, everything was there except that personal touch which means so much even to the littlest girl. Ethel was used to being cared for by others than her parents, but it came especially hard on her this morning. She turned, leaving the beautiful things as they had been placed about the tree, and walked to the end window whence she could get a view of the little house beyond the garage over the back wall. There was a Christmas tree in Maggie's house, too. It wouldn't have made a respectable branch for Ellen's tree, and the trimmings were so cheap and poor that Celeste would have thrown them into the wastebasket immediately. There were a few common, cheap, perishable little toys around the tree on the floor, but to Maggie it was a glimpse of heaven. She stood in her little white nightgown, no such thing as dressing for her on Christmas morning, staring around her. The whole family was grouped about her, even the littlest brothers who went to school because they were not big enough to work forgot their own joy in watching their little sister. Her father, her mother, the big boys, all in a state of more or less disheveled undress, stood around her, pointing out the first thing and then the other, which they had been able to get for her by denying themselves some of the necessities of life. Maggie was so happy that her eyes brimmed, yet she did not cry. She laughed, she clapped her hands, and kissed them all round and finally found herself, a big orange in one hand, a tin trumpet in the other, perched on her father's broad shoulders leading a frantic march around the narrow confines of the living room. As she passed by one window, she caught a glimpse of the alley. It had been snowing throughout the night and the ground was white. Oh, she screamed with delight, let me see the snow on Christmas morning. Her father walked over to the window, parted the cheap lace curtains while Maggie clapped her hands gleefully at the prospect. Presently she lifted her eyes and looked toward the other window high up in the air where Ethel stood, a mournful little figure. 
Maggie's papa looked too. He knew how cheap and poor were the little gifts that he had bought for his daughter. I wish, he thought, that she would have some of the things that child up there has. Maggie, however, was quite content. She smiled, flourished her trumpet, waved her orange, but there was no answering smile on Ethel's face now. Finally, the wistful little girl in the big house languidly waved her hand, and then Maggie was taken away to be dressed, lest she should catch cold after the mischief was done. I hope she's having a nice Christmas, said Maggie, referring to Ethel. I hope so too, answered her mother, wishing that her little girl might have some of the beautiful gifts that she knew must be in that great house. Whatever she has, said Maggie gleefully, she can't have any nicer Christmas than I have that you and Papa and the boys gave me. I'm just as happy as I can be. Over in the big house, Ethel was also wishing. She was so unhappy since she had seen Maggie in the arms of her big bearded father standing by the window that she could control herself no longer. She turned away and threw herself down on the floor in front of the tree and buried her face in her hands and burst into tears. It was Christmas morning, and she was all alone. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Bit of a sad one, but just goes to show you that money cannot buy happiness and the spirit of Christmas is not what's under the tree, but who's around it. Sorry for the cliches, but that's what I thought of when I heard that story. I'm discovering it for the first time just like you are, and that's one of my favorite things about doing these Burr Months bonus episodes. Not only a chance to connect with you and keep the spirit going all throughout the year, but also to discover some forgotten Christmas fiction. I'm going to be back again next week with another one just in time for Halloween, and I've got a spine-tingling Christmas ghost story in store. I hope you come back then, and until we meet again, let me remind you as always that Christmas Past is produced in wonderful Willow Glen, California by yours truly, Brian Earl. You can drop me a line anytime, and I sure wish you would because I love hearing from you. You can reach me at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com or connect on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And let me invite you to join our private Christmas Past Facebook group because we're celebrating the Burr months, and then of course we'll celebrate the Christmas season together. And let me remind you one more time to send a Christmas memory. Just record a voice memo into your phone and send it to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. And if you have a minute and you're feeling the Christmas spirit, why not help more people discover this show by rating and reviewing it on Apple Podcasts? It really does help more people find the show, so it's kind of like spreading Christmas cheer. And I'll send you a handwritten Christmas card and a Christmas past sticker as my way of saying thanks. Reach out for details on that. Until we meet again, stay safe and healthy, look out for one another, and may your days be merry and bright.